so let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to the faculty lounge at U of SC. I am uh, Dr. Toby Jenkins Henry, and I am the director of the Museum of Education and associate professor in the uh, College of Education. I uh, teach in the Educational Leadership and Policy Studies Department, um, particularly in the Higher Education Program. Very excited to be back with everyone today for another uh, episode and session of the Faculty Lounge. Today we have Dr. Tia Brown McNair as our guest, and I am very excited to engage this conversation. So let me first um, read a quick bio before we, we bring you into the lounge and, and start this conversation today. So Dr. Tia Brown McNair is the vice president in the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Student Success and executive director for the Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation Campus Centers at the Association of American Colleges and Universities. That's a long, <laughs> long title in Washington, DC. She oversees both funded projects and AACU's continuing programs on equity, inclusive excellence, high impact practices, and student successes. It was just in a conversation um, earlier about high impact practices in higher ed. McNair also di directs AACU's Summer Institutes on High Impact Practices and Student Success and Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation Campus Centers. McNair currently serves as the project director for several initiatives. Um, so the, the Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation Campus Initiatives, uh, Strengthening Guided Pathways and Career Success by Ensuring Students Are Learning, and Purposeful Pathways, Faculty Planning, and Curricular Coherence. McNair also oversees AACU's yearly thematic conferences. Prior to joining the association, uh, Dr. McNair, served as the Assistant Director of the National College Access Network in Washington, DC. Uh, she also served as so, uh, a Social Scientist Assistant Program Director in the Directorate for Education and Human Resources at the National Science Foundation, Director of University Relations at the University of Charleston in Charleston, West Virginia, the Statewide Coordinator for the Educational Talent Search Project at West Virginia Higher Education Policy Commission, and the Interim Associate Director of Admissions and Recruitment Services at West Virginia State University. So thank you so much. Welcome and thank you for joining us today, Dr. McNair. Uh, thank you so much. And we should have sent you my short bio. So we <laughs> well that look that was short. I, I cut I cut um oh. <laughs> a, a lot. <laughs> so but good stuff, good stuff. So um I want to before we start um this, so there was a message that was sent in the chat um by South Carolina Educational uh, Television, asking everyone to change your names by hoovering over the corner of your individual screen. Uh, so I, I sent everyone um, a quick reminder um, uh, Zoom link this morning, and um, and what it did was wind up having you register or show up as me. So if you can just go in and change your name so that we can see uh, who else present in the community and uh, in the last today, that would be wonderful. But Dr. McNair, let's get into our conversation today. Uh, so I start each um, session first by going back to who we are personally, our, our cultural um, identity, our cultural history, our cultural experiences, uh, to better kind of understand how those experiences have influenced, shaped, and even propelled us into this important work that we're doing that, you know, that all of us are so, so passionate about. Um, and so the, the, the first question that I have for you is a question that I ask of everyone. Um, I'd like for you to go back to the beginning. Before becoming a scholar, tell me a little about where you're from, your upbringing, and how that matters to you. How has your cultural and community experience influenced who you are professionally? I think that's such an important question to ask and thank you. But first, thank you for inviting me to be here with you today. Yeah. And I'm looking forward to this conversation. Um, so for me, I'm from Southwest Virginia, a small town outside of Roanoke, Virginia. And I am um, deeply influenced by my family. And I'm trying to make sure I get through this without being emotional because years, uh, 
several years ago, my father passed away and it was a sudden, he passed away and he's such a major influence in my life. I was raised by a deacon and a deaconess. So church is very much part of who I am and my identity, my family. I was deeply raised in the, in the church, in the Baptist church. And my family is, oh gosh, my sister, my mom, my husband, my son, my aunts and uncles, all of them influence who I am today. I am a person of faith, as I've already mentioned. I'm also a person that realizes the connection to community and that we all have a responsibility and a shared responsibility to do our part to uplift one another. Um, just recently, I had the opportunity at speaking at a university that's close to my home. And in that they were doing land acknowledgements and they were talking about the history of the institution and that history of the institution and how it was tied to the black community and the slave labor that helped build, the, build this institution. And I didn't know how emotional that was gonna be for me because that community they were talking about, those are my ancestors, that's my family, that's, mm. that, that's my community. And when we talk about the impact of racism and slavery and hatred and all those pieces on us, we don't know when those moments of emotion are gonna come. And it came to me that day, and it just, just happened last week as I was speaking, as they were talking about the black community and the connection with this particular institution, I just, I said to them, I said, I'm sorry, this is emotional for me because the community you're talking about is my community. Mm -hmm. um, my family has been there for years and years and the churches that you see around you are fam are my family members and they're they founded those churches and are still go there so it's 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 deeply important to me um being from the country i had a bike that said country girl and i'm proud of being from the country and you can probably hear it in my accent uh, in my southern <laughs> accent but all of those pieces are important to me and I get a bit bits and pieces for all from all of them yeah yeah you know I um it's been interesting I the university where I am now at University of South Carolina I um I'm from here and so you know this is like the first time in yeah, I, I was gone for 20 years. And so, you know, finally coming back and actually working in my hometown um, has been a, a really interesting experience. And I, and I think you're right. There, like there's something about the rootedness that makes even all of the things that um, that you're we're doing here and that happens here, uh, it, it just matters a little bit more. I feel it, you know, a, a, a little more uh, deeply than I think I might have uh, felt it, you know, at other institutions and, and, and everything. But yeah, that community connectedness is, is, is definitely real. And just to be honest with you, so let me just tell you, before I even finish, someone in the audience had already called my aunt, who had called <laughs> another aunt. And those of you who are from the country know how you know how that goes in the phone yeah. chain game. But then it finally got to my mom, and they were saying, "Oh, she's so smart, <laughs> and she's so this, and she's going places." And my mom said, "She's already been places. What are you talking about? <laughs> she's going. She's not going places. She's been there." And so I think it's just a, it's amazing to have that connection and remember you can't get rid of that that, and I don't want to that no. that um, small town feel of we're proud of you and keep doing what you're doing and how that chain goes and just that connection. I, I love it. Yeah. You can trade yeah. it for the world. Yeah. So let's get a little bit into uh, some of the, 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 this work that you, that you are doing and the, um, the impact that you have been able to make. Um, so I'm excited about this conversation because um, as, as we've been kind of wrestling with broader concepts and, and issues and topics, uh, I think, one of the things that's um, particularly meaningful about this conversation with the work that you're doing at AACU is that um, the, they're, they're actionable uh, efforts. And, you know, we're talking about like, you know, what is it looking like in, in, in trying to do, create this change and, and, uh, and do this work and, and build out capacity, you know, across the country. Um, for, for folks to engage, engage it in a different way. So I wanna loosely base our conversation on the, uh, the writing and the work around building the racial equity ecosystem in higher education for sustainable change. Um, and I love this 
phrasing of an, you know, an ecosystem, eco, I keep saying ecosystem, ecosystem, um, because, you know, like the literal definition kind of talks about it being these living organisms in relation to um, even kind of stagnant or, 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 or non-living spaces or whatever, right? And so when you think about institutions and universities being these campuses and buildings, these, these, these set structures, um, but then to talk about ecosystems is to center the, the people, the communities and the people, and not only on campus, but surrounding campus and, uh, and, and all of those, those lives and those spirits and those lived experience. So in the article, um, you and your co-authors, Eric Ford and Gooseby Smith, Yes, Jay. Jay Gizzi-Smith from the Citadel. Jay Gizzi-Smith. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. From down here, our way. Yes. Um, yes. Argue that the case for racial equity in higher ed cannot be made in isolation from the communities in which our universities reside. Um, mm -hmm. This actually happens a lot. The university um, tackles issues, um, and, and just because we see ourselves as, as expert in, you know, whatever. So, right, so we take on large social issues uh, like racism, and often in a very insular way, focusing on the campus and not necessarily the community or the city, um, you know, et cetera. And so some might argue that um, that might let the university off the hook for the racial injustices to which they might orchestrate on the local community, right? The role that they've played in the local community if we're not talking about um, the local. Uh, so talk to us about this. Talk to us about uh, this idea that you can't do this work without the inclusion of the community. Why does community involvement matter so much in this? So first, let me just start by acknowledging the work of Gail Christopher, who is Dr. Gail Christopher, who's the visionary and architect of the TRHC framework when she was a senior vice president at the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. So I want to make sure that she's lifted up in this conversation because this is her vision and her work. And, and her and her colleagues came, came to AAC and U and approached us and talked about the work of truth, racial healing and transformation from a community perspective and said, we know that we can't do this work without thinking about how to prepare the next generation of leaders and what we're supposed to be doing with this. So they took this idea of a community. TRHT is community focused. So let's just start there. The whole concept of the framework, the work is about the community. And when we launched and developed the TRHT campus centers at AAC and U as our part in this work, the not requirement, but the strong recommendation for each TRHT campus center was to have a community, to have community partners. And the reason why we said that that was so important was to stay one true to the overarching framework and design of truth, racial healing transformation, but also to be acknowledge the fact that our community influences what happens in our institutions and our institutions influence what happens in our community. There's reciprocity there. And I think sometimes we, don't acknowledge the influence of our own funds of knowledge, the influence of our own experiences in our actual experiences and how we actually make decisions at the institution. We don't stay at the institutions, we go out into the community. We are of the community that we are part of. And those experiences definitely are intertwined with the work that we have to do. Our students are in the communities, we're in the communities and they're intimately connected. I don't know if you just recently read the story about Appalachian State University that was in Ensign Higher Ed, where the students were talking about what was happening on campus and then what happened to them and the, the, the words that were used, that they were called out of their names and the things that were said to them when they were in the community. How can you deal with racism on a campus and not deal with what we will experience when we leave that campus mm -hmm. and vice versa? So that automatic connection and saying that we can't be an ecosystem, an isolated ecosystem is, is a huge um, acknowledgement and it's mm -hmm. the truth. Yeah. I mean, it's the truth about our lived experiences and we've got to be on and we've got to be honest and we've got to think about the communities that all of us are members of. Mm -hmm. So in, um, in building this ecosystem and practice, ACU has, in, has established these truth, racial healing and transformation campus centers. Mm -hmm. Don't wanna dial back because a lot of people, 
in the audience may not be familiar with them or know exactly what they are. Like when you um, when you give the the name the TR HT yes. Um, so according to the article, this was a partnership with. And now you have like the last I read was twenty three. It, it may be more. 25 higher, institutions. Now. 25 institutions. Mm -hmm. Okay, so 25 higher ed institutions have um, come on board to create these truth, racial healing, and transformation campus centers on their campuses. So tell mm -hmm. us about what these centers are doing, what have been the outcomes, and, and where you see this work going. Because you, you state that it's a focus on systemic uh, transformation, not just the transformation of individuals, right? So it's more than just the kind of racial dialogues that y'all are, you, in this work, y'all are, are, are trying to, to create uh, systemic change. So what is that looking like? What are these centers doing? So I'll try to do this as succinctly as possible because it is maybe difficult because usually I have slides that I can show you. Yeah, yeah, so I'm gonna yeah. try to do this as succinctly okay. as possible. So we do have 25 institutions that we're partnering with that serve as host institutions. And they develop a vision a visionary statement of what their communities would look like, feel like, and be like when there was no longer the false belief in a hierarchy of human value. So the goal of TRHT, and this is because Gail is a big Star Trek fan, she uses the term jettison, to jettison the false belief in a hierarchy of human value that actually fuels systemic and structural racism, or as Ibram Kendi says, racism. <laughs> Let's just call mm -hmm. it what it is, mm -hmm. racism in our society. So the, in doing this, each institution has developed an action plan based on understanding the narrative about race and they're collecting institutional data. They're looking at um, artifacts, they're looking at uh, curricula, they're working with their community partners, they're looking at symbols on campus. They are doing interviews with educators and students and community leaders and asking about what is your narrative on race? We believe strongly that many institutions haven't spent the time and the research and the data gathering to even have those conversations to understand what the actual narrative about race is and how people understand racism, where it shows up on campus, where it exists, what are the actual racialized practices. As my co-author of the book from Equity Talk to Equity Walk, Estella Ben Simone, who is a guru in racial equity, yes. who is mm -hmm. all of our gurus, and mm -hmm. then she's the leader of that. She said, we have to be anthropologists. And I've been and that terminology, we just mm -hmm. talked about that in our Inside Higher Ed article about the book, is that we need to be able to see where racism exists. So the very first part of this is understanding what the narrative about race actually is. On yeah, the, what it the looks like. Get it, it get it, get it, like. to wrap our heads around it, yeah. Exactly, how does it manifest itself? How does it appear? What are racialized practices on campuses? Because oftentimes, institution leaders and educators and people, they struggle with actually seeing that. Mm -hmm. Then we have a big, the biggest part, one of the huge elements of this is racial healing and relationship building. And uh, Gail's getting ready to come out with a book on RX racial healing circles that will be, that we will release at AACNU in a, and probably in a couple of months or so, where we talk about this methodology of using circles and having deep dialogue and deep conversations that build trust and authentic relationships so that we can even have the deeper conversations about race. And these are not restorative justice conversations. These are not intergroup dialogues. This is about us getting to know each other and our interconnectedness, our common humanity, going deeper. And so there's a methodology for that. So we wanna focus on the concept of truth telling, of narrative, is sharing your narrative and your experiences. But we also want to build on that concept that we need to heal, that there's trauma associated with experiencing racism, that there's a mental, physical, psychological impact that we need to address in, when we deal with racism. And that's not always acknowledged. No. And we know that, and many of that, that it's dismissed. I mean, look, honestly, look what Jared Kushner said yesterday, mm -hmm. that it's us complaining. Mm -hmm that is people of color complaining about their situation versus acknowledging that their that racism power privilege all those elements that that promote hate actually are part of our society and that there's an influence on us physically and there's harm associated with that mm -hmm. so we talk about the concept of healing and, and the importance of that in this work and then we look at the structures 
and the systems and the policies that actually promote a hierarchy of human value, whether that's through segregation policies, whether that's through housing policies, wealth distribution, education, mass incarceration. We look at economic policies, law, I mean, just across the board. And our campus leaders are actually developing educational experiences and, and reimagining educational experiences to actually identify areas of where that hierarchy of human value is present. And then talking with students on how do you dismantle that? So yeah. that's a quick so they So they're, they're literally looking at their institutions, like these policies on like, you know, I hear the larger society, you know, policies and structures or whatever, but we're, they're also looking at like the campus itself yeah. and, and, and dissecting those things. Yeah. See, I think that's so important. A couple of weeks ago, um, we hosted, uh, Dr. Patina Love, um, for, mm -hmm. it was, it was actually a different series. It was a distinguished lecture that she gave, but everyone's confusing it and thinking it was this, this too. But that's, you're doing too many things when people can't even be like, they're confused about everything. But so but one of the things that she talked about in her, um, her lecture was, and, and I think she talks about this a lot, is that higher ed institutions or, or educational institutions probably in general are really good at creating interventions that deal with like the people that are victimized by racism, but not dealing with racism itself. Like there's a mm -hmm. whole bunch of people working on creating experiences to, um, to help students to, um, to, to, you know, have a, an alternative experience from this, the negative experience or the, um, to, to be more inclusive or, you know, that type of thing. But the, like, where's the team that's working on racism itself um, and, and mm -hmm. not these interventions that are responsive. And it, it makes me think like, so, you know, I'm a, I'm a, a breast cancer survivor. And so a lot of the times, like a lot of my metaphors are always around, um, medicine and, and health. But w when I first heard her um, talking about that, one of the things that I was thinking about was like, yeah, that that's definitely true. It's almost like we have in higher ed, a bunch of, we have a lot of nurses and medical techs that mm -hmm. are um, treating wounds and prescribing medicine for pain. Um, we even have a lot of people that are drawing blood and, you know, researchers analyzing, seeing, you know, what are we experiencing? What's going on, you know, underneath there. But what we don't have are a lot of surgeons that are opening up the institution and taking mm -hmm. that disease out, you know, yes. and just really working to transform the institution. So I think what you're saying here is that space in these, 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 uh, these campus centers to do that, to dissect the institution, that's incredible. Yeah, and that's exactly what we need to do. I mean, just being honest about the history and the narrative about race. I mean, we have campuses that are going back and looking at their history when they made the decision to close off the campus to the Black community and keep the um, entrance to the campus open on the white side of town and what that meant and the message that that sent to the community and how that actually had an influence and an impact on the institution. We're asking campuses, campuses are reimagining their narrative on race and saying, wait a minute, we actually didn't get this story right. This experience wasn't the, the way that we're telling it. We need to go back and re-interview people and have conversations and be honest about our narrative on race and deal with the harm that, may, that we, have, we have inflicted or we may have caused. I think that that's so important for us to do as leaders, as educators, if we're really going to be truthful to transform our institution. And that's going to be an ongoing process. So I've been having these conversations with other educators and leaders at other national associations about the transformation process. We want to get to a point where we're transformed, but I'll just be pleased that we're transforming. Yeah, yeah. We're saying we're that, doing can we get in the transform? Yeah, can you move yeah. can you move in some type of way, in mm -hmm. a positive way? Mm -hmm. So, and, and what do those, these tech campus teams look like? Like who, who all is involved? So we definitely have faculty. We have administrators, students, definitely community partners based on the action plan that each team developed. So each campus center has their own action plan 
based on the framework, but it's aligned with their strategic and their institutional priorities, and also on their own preliminary analysis of where their key leverage points are, where they can actually change, and how they can partner with their community. So the teams look different, like we have some that have church leaders on them, others that have nonprofit leaders and within their community, but the students are definitely at the heart of it, sharing their narrative, having conversations. We've had, um, TRHC campus centers that are collaborating with the police within their community, having healing circles with the police officers in their community so that they can hear the experiences of the students and having this conversation. All of this is very yeah. important. So there's not, it's not a one size fits all. So I want to make sure everybody understands that, that we're not saying that this is the only strategy or this is the strategy that you should use. This is something that is going to have to fit within your community and within your institution. But then you also have to design the elements that are going to make sense yeah. to yeah, yeah. your work and what mm -hmm. needs to happen to eliminate racism. Mm -hmm. I think that, okay, so I, um, for a couple of years, I worked at University of Maryland College Park. So I'm familiar mm -hmm. with, you know, institutes up there in UMBC in particular. Um, and when I saw that they, um, that they dedicated the Shriver Center to this, I, you know, I know that that's a big deal because I know what that center was, you know, to the institution and, and, and everything. And so I think it, it speaks a lot to dedicate, um, you know, this, this, um, this, this, institutional space that was a pride, a point of pride and, and um, important um, to dedicating it to racial justice and, and, um, and, and literacy and healing and, you know, and, and all of that stuff, whatever. So um, what, what other kinds of commitments like do you, are, are, are institutions doing that are a part of this? So since you mentioned UMBC, Eric Ford, who runs the Choice Program, who's the director there, and then Frank Anderson, who's his partner, um, I think he's the associate director there. They definitely have done some amazing work with embedding TRHT within the work of the Shriver Center. So I think that that's so important for how they're reimagining community-based learning based on the TRHT mm -hmm. framework and service learning, because they really want people who work in Baltimore students who go out and do service and community history to understand the narrative about race within this community yeah. and within the city of Baltimore and what the people who live there, what they're experiencing. So I think that that's very important. Um, we have Brown University having deep dialogues with students, theme, you know, thematic affinity groups, those particular aspects of their work tied with their chaplain with their, the center for their, in their chaplain's office. And mm -hmm. I think that that's so important to make the connection between healing and our religious priorities and our religious beliefs. I think that's so important. I also think that um, the Citadel, which since you mentioned mm -hmm. their partnership with the local churches, and we all unfortunately know the history of the, you know, the tragedy that happened mm -hmm. at Mother Emanuel. And we, we recognize that, we honor that, and we, we use that as motivation for our TRHT work and our partnership with them to actually help with the healing process and to advance and to address racism within the community in Charleston. The mayor's office is a partner with the Citadel in that. Okay. We also have University of Hawaii, Manoa, really focused on oh, Native Hawaiians. Nice. I used yes, to work there they, too. <laughs> you work, used to work there yeah. too, Toby. My God, yeah. where, where have you not? Where have you not been, Toby? <laughs> so we, so we definitely want to have that. I mean, just really understanding colonization and the history and the impact on Indigenous peoples in this country. That you know that the oppression and taking of lands. I mean, that's a healing yep. process that we have to go to through too. And the legacy of that. I mean, that we're yeah. all experiencing. There's a long legacy with racism and oppression in our history, which people need to understand. And they, I mean, that's part of what we mean when we say being equity-minded, understanding the history of race and racism within this country. So the campuses are doing all different things. Some are partnering with their K through 12, uh, New York Rutgers University, Newark, they have TRHT sites mm -hmm. within the local libraries for younger students to get involved with the TRHT effort. So many different things. And if you're interested mm -hmm. in learning more about it, you can go to our website and I saw that in the chat. So thank you for putting mm -hmm. that in there. But also we have a publication called We Hold These Truths, 
And if you go on our website at aacu.org, you can at least see the work of our first 10 campus centers. But I'm excited about the work that we're doing with our more recent campus centers as well. And we'll be publicizing that on a regular basis on our website. Okay, so some of my students had uh, a few questions. So sure. Michaela Morris um, asked, what obstacles or barriers did the um, TRHT team face in looking to community leadership to inform transformative practices rather than campus leadership? Well, I, I think that's a good question. I mean, I'm trying to make sure I understand it. So mm -hmm. we had to first, when TRHT campus center started, we had to get the commitment of the institution. So we definitely made, had to make sure that this was not going to be one of those off, you, we, we, you know how they, sometimes we marginalize any mm -hmm. DEI efforts you know yeah, what I'm yeah. talking about. Tammy. Yeah, Those and I used to, to run side. cultural center, so. Uh. Okay, all right, so you get it. So they could put to the <laughs> side. So we wanted to make sure that it was embedded into the structural priorities uh, and the strategic priorities of the institution and that it was going to have the support necessary to succeed beyond our initial pieces. But with the community partners, um, it depended on that particular institution and their relationship with the community. Some had to spend a longer amount of time going in explaining what TRHT is, what they wanted to do with their community partners, how they wanted to build those relationships before they were, um, let's say it embraced mm -hmm. within that community. Mm -hmm. So that relationship building was a huge part of the work. And some of those obstacles were trying to understand well, do we call it RX racial healing circles? Like even at the Citadel, they don't call it that. They call them sit, listen sessions. And it took them a year to invite the community in to have their first circle. Mm -hmm. So those relationships needed to be built so that it was saying, this is something that we're doing as part of what we see we need to do as an institution that who's part of this community, that's part of this community. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, so Quinn Curitan, is asking about, okay, he, he shares a quote from the article. Um, next, we plan to explore, quote, next we plan to explore with the Citadel Foundation, the possibility of our center being a line item to which donors can direct support. So I think that was written by your colleague who is at the Citadel. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so Quinn's question is, a. Uh, we know that donors will make million dollar investments towards upgrading athletic facilities at PWIs that are overpopulated with black student athletes. However, racial equity as related to financial support from stakeholders is little to none compared to other programs on campus. My question is when institutions fail to provide financial support for programs like TRHT, what does that say about the institution's stance against racial equity? So we've all heard that phrase tell me where you put your money and I'll tell you what you value yeah right I that, call that, it um I wrote this article a couple of years ago just uh with a, a playoff of um Gwen Guthrie's um ain't nothing going on but the rent like don't ask me how my department's doing <laughs> ain't nothing going on but the rent <laughs> we need money we need money show me the money if you want uh some diversity outcome exactly exactly sorry, and, sorry. And, go ahead no, 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 Toby, that was great because, I mean, but that's true though. If we, we have to focus in on what it is that we value, but the reality is, just like I said earlier, is that many institutional leaders struggle to see where racism actually shows up on campus, where the, the, that's that part where I was saying that we need to be anthropologists, we need to interrogate, we need to see it, we need to acknowledge it, and I think that that's a struggle. Um, we're seeing that, I mean, I don't want to name the institution, but there's an institution right now that the leader resigned because they said, well, I don't see it. I don't see it as happening. But even though you had the, the narratives of students and alums saying, this is what I What's experienced mm -hmm. on campus. So the investment's not there because the acknowledgement isn't there. And the acknowledgement isn't there because we are thinking that it doesn't, I mean, there's some people and some leaders that think that it doesn't mm -hmm. exist. They think that we are in this complaining mode, that re the reality is that racism is not part of our everyday lives. I mean, and that unfortunately, and we all know this, that's not true. So that piece right there that we've also heard 
many people say from our own president survey and others that they're going to reinvest more money into our diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives, that they are going to think about resource development and allocating resources that are going to support anti-racist work or you know, an anti-racist education or what it means to be an anti-racist institution. I just hope that comes to fruition. Mm -hmm. I hope that mm -hmm. it wasn't just because of what happened this summer, because uh, fortunately, we see that it continues. And we, it, it has, it was there before, it was here this summer, and it unfortunately is probably going to continue. So I, I hope that we as higher ed leaders continue to invest in the important work of DEI, but it does send a message. But supposedly what we're hearing is that more leaders are saying they're going to invest, mm -hmm. but more into this, yeah. into the efforts to make a more equitable institutions. That's good. So I'm gonna pull a couple questions from the, the chat because we've, mm -hmm. we've, we've got several here. Um, so I'm gonna follow this one up because Quinn mentioned the overpopulation of um, the over concentration of, of um, black students in athletics. Uh, so I see a question mm -hmm. that's uh, drawing on that. So we'll go there and then I'll go to a couple others. Um, but what's being done in, the, in athletics where 80% of the student athletes are people of color, how can we move towards racial equity in sports? That one comes from my husband, William Henry. <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> I'm looking at the name now. <laughs> You're looking at the okay. name. The name. Yeah, so, yeah. I, so, I mean, I think that's a great question. I don't necessarily, I don't work in athletics, so I don't have that. But I do mm -hmm. know that um, athletes have, um, they can utilize their voices as we've seen the professional athletes do this summer and actually demand system changing work, systemic change, and you know, for the work they're doing because the institution does depend on them a lot. They make a lot of money off of them and their participation in sports. And I think that there's an opportunity for them to speak and to use that agency that I think many of them, if they don't know it, but they do have it because they are resources, unfortunately. I mean, that's how they've seen at the institution to bring in additional funding and some additional support. And I think that there's an opportunity there um, for them to do that. And we've seen that happen. I mean, if you look at some of the, again, I don't wanna name institutions, but some athletes have spoken up and there have been oh, yeah. some changes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in some programs, some dismissals in yeah. some programs of people that have probably been able to get away with it before Mm -hmm. And now the athletes are saying, no, this is what happened to me. And the institution is actually taking that action yeah, and doing yeah. it and leading that work. And, mm -hmm. and if you yeah. haven't, just Google it. You can see it recently that those changes have been happening. So I think that the athletes do have agency mm -hmm. in some areas and some institutions more so than others. But utilizing that is going to be a powerful piece, especially given how diverse the athletic departments are. Yeah, yeah, I know in, um, in our work with um, AERA this year for their uh, upcoming conference, um, there are gonna be some particular sessions specifically on that, on um, activism among student athletes and just the excitement around that uh, because there's a culture of fear of you know you losing all of the resources that even have you there in the first place um, that would cause athletes to, to second guess or rethink whether or not they can stand up or speak out uh, and, and everything. So the, 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 the actions that we're seeing um, is most definitely exciting. I almost sometimes like, I'm, I'm like, what would it be? You know, is, could there be a possibility of a, of a diversity and inclusion tax when you look at the, the amount of money that's being generated or whatever that, you know, athletics in my perfect world, they would be, they would have a D, DEI tax and a percentage of those funds that are um, being generated on the backs of uh, predominantly black athletes would go in to the institution for diversity and inclusion efforts um, to yeah. get more students on the other side of the university to help all students um, in, in navigating the experience. But yeah, to, to, to build up that infrastructure. Um, I think that's a, I think it's a great idea. And they, and I, and I get their level of fear. I get, I get the level of fear and the, opportunity of saying, I mean, not, not the opportunity, but the, um, what's the word that I'm looking for? 
the possibility that they may lose their opportunities. Um, and that's real for many of them because those are, you know, you don't want to take away that opportunity from them if the institution threatens that. I mean, you just never know what's gonna yeah. happen. So they're gonna have to be strategic and they're gonna have to think about power and privilege yeah. and how to actually approach this in a way and get as a group come together. There power, there's power in numbers when yeah. it comes to athletes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we have a history of, you know what I'm saying? Like when you look at the 1968 mm -hmm. Olympics, I mean, people, you know, they lost all kinds of opportunities and, and everything. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah, but I like yeah. that idea. I like that yeah, idea. Yeah. I like that. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good idea. Okay. So I'm not going to to attempt your name because I know I'm going to uh, mess it up, but thank you for this question. Um, asked twice about going back to the 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 um, racial healing, the, the, the truth, T-R-H-T centers. I'm just going to do yeah. the, the acronym. Um, uh, a question about governing and politics, like politicians and what mm -hmm. role, um, when you talk about community engagement, are, are they involved? So will you consider governing as part of the ecosystem? If you do, how would you change it when the policy can be controlled by a minority, for example, Supreme Court for life? <laughs> Wow. Okay. So there's like three different comments. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there's like the Supreme Court, definitely with the policy piece. Um, well, they're, so we're, they're giving Supreme Court as an example, like it, as a, a space that becomes hard to change or navigate when people are serving for life. And so then that, that can mean that it will stay the same for a very long time. You know what I'm saying? Like, so how, how are we dealing with that, the, the political aspects of the ecosystem? I know that's a big issue here for us in South Carolina. Yeah, so I'm just gonna say this and then I'll just let it go. We don't know what's gonna happen with the Supreme Court depending on the election. So maybe there'll be changes to actually help navigate the, the way the Supreme Court is right now. So I'm just gonna say that. It's because we don't know because there's not an answer that has been given yet. But I do know that the policymakers have an influence on how those systems can be changed. And we need to actually um, work with them and collaborate with them on this concept that we talk about truth, racial healing transformation. So just so you know, Congresswoman Barbara Lee from California has been working and is working on a resolution and legislation for truth, racial healing and transformation in Congress, in the House of Representatives. There's a group of us that have been working with her, uh, Gail Christopher and her team. Our institutions have been asked to sign on to the resolution and this work. We're hoping and, and being very hopeful and optimistic that the work that we're doing here with TRHT and higher ed, because this is also happening in places too, in communities as well that there's going to be a greater understanding among policymakers about what's happening, what needs to happen so that we can advance their understanding and the policies that can influence the policies that are being developed. And to think strategically and help policymakers understand racialized consequences with our decisions. We talk about this in the book a lot that we don't think about racialized consequences in our decisions. And I think that that's something that we need to actually examine more critically with our policymakers, which is something that's being led by Congresswoman Barbara Lee from California. So that's there are fantastic. efforts, yeah. exactly, there are efforts. You can Google that too, that's out there. That's been publicly announced and stated. So there are policymakers out there saying that these changes need to come. Now, as far as unfortunately, as far as we're talking about the Supreme Court, as I said, we're in a situation where we just had a new justice sworn in last night the balance for conservatives to liberals, six to three. We're gonna be in this situation now where we're gonna think, start thinking about what does that mean for equity and representation of the people. And there are, as you, and without ACU's nonpartisans, so I'm trying to remain nonpartisan in this, but there are leaders who are thinking about what that representation looks like and it should be of the people and for the people and what changes need to be made to have that aligned. So I, I'm all. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Do you, do you see mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Yeah, 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 without, yeah, yeah, yeah. without saying mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's hopeful. That that is hopeful if, if that indeed um, happens. Okay. It, it, another question from the the chat is uh, regarding community colleges. So many of the participating colleges are four year institutions, 
in your initiative. Can you share about how TRHT looks on community college campuses or, or do y'all have uh, community college partners? Yes, yes, we have a couple of community colleges. Austin Community College is um, was one of our first TRHT campus centers and they are leaders. I was just on a panel with their president for excellency in education for their meeting. And he was talking about how the work of TRHT is deeply connected to their diversity, equity, and inclusion strategic initiative. They have a chief diversity officer, but they also have an executive director, Kyrie Williams, for TRHT. And they're working collaboratively together to think about what it means to help prepare students, to help them understand, like we talked about the narrative about race and the hierarchy of human value. They're developing a certificate and badge in TRHT for their students that actually go through the process of understanding this work and collecting data and evidence. They have done over a hundred structured interviews with community partners and students and leaders, and they now have a repository of data that students can do research on. So, I mean, it's a, it's a great mm -hmm. thing, the way that they're actually connecting this understanding of who they are as an institution, what they're getting right, what they're getting wrong, whether the narrative, the truth, truthful experiences of their students, how does this lead to change? How do they embrace and engage the board of their board of trustees? How do they engage the institutional leaders? What is this, how does this align with their institutional priorities of being and achieving the dream institution, of being an institution that's involved in excellency in education, of being involved with AACU? They're being very thoughtful about alignment and purpose and thinking about the whole student, educating the whole student and not just looking at equity and student outcomes. Yes, 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 yes. And you said that um, in some spaces like, what was it, Rutgers Newark, there, that it's mm -hmm. going into a pipeline. So it's not just even yes. higher ed, they're involving P through 12. Exactly. So they're in local libraries. They have a partnership with their local libraries. They're mm -hmm. doing summer programs with their students in middle school to talk to them about uh, systems and structures and policies mm -hmm. and bias within those and, and how the, the false belief in a hierarchy of human value actually fuels the systems that they're a part of. And there was a story we went to visit. We did a site visit. And one of the partners stood up and said, I was so proud of our middle school students. They were having an interview with one of our su superintendents and they were asking them about their experience about, you know, with race and racism within this community. And one of the middle school students stood up and said, well, let me tell you what I learned from truth, racial healing and transformation work that I'm part of. And she says she was just so proud that 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 it connected with them mm -hmm. and the work that they were doing was embedded into their vocabulary and into their mm -hmm. their knowledge and it and I think it's just very powerful for them that's how we're going to make change yeah is when they when our young people and our our future leaders and the people that are going to start saying this is unacceptable mm -hmm. you know we value people based on this false hierarchy and we need to stop doing that and value people as humans and as we go, as we move forward and, and we say in TRHT, and this is what they said, there's a publication called Restoring the Wholeness that the Kellogg Foundation released. Before you can transform systems and structures, you've got to do the people work first. Yes. And I say that all the time. And it's so important for us to focus on what the people, mm -hmm. what, what the people who are experiencing our indigenous, what they are understanding and their engagement is with dismantling racism. Yeah, yeah. In uh, the mu museum um, in our college, um, I have a, a um, exhibit this semester on the history of violence in education. So it's looking at violence in a lot of different, you know, iterations of, of it. But one of the things that um, that um, I had the statements that I have that frames out the exhibit is schools don't fail kids, people do. Like we run the schools, we run the school, yeah. every institution, people are running them. And, yes. uh, and so you, you, we can't hide behind this institutional, this and institutional that, because it's really doing the work of the people within those spaces. Exactly. Let's, uh, let's keep it straight. We implement mm -hmm. the policies, we design them, yeah. we evaluate them, we assess them, we do it, the whole thing, we make them. I mean, just across mm -hmm. the board, it's people. Mm -hmm. And if we don't underdo that work first, then we're always going to perpetuate this circle. Yeah, yeah. So let me get one last question from the chat uh, before we move into our quick fire. So Frank Gauze 
is asking um, a question very similar to uh, Michaela Moore said a, a two part. Um, and so she was also wanting to know more about this. What is the data reflected about the TRHD institutions and their impact on like things like recruitment and retention, faculty and students, race center coursework outside of African American studies, like campus wide programming, et cetera. Like what, what, what do you know about the outcomes and the impact so far? Yeah, so, and that's a great question too. So we have a national evaluator for the TRHC campus centers and each TRHC campus center has an evaluation plan. We know from preliminary work that the students who engage in the TRHC effort or participate with the TRHC centers have higher sense of belonging, they're more engaged, but they're automatic, but those are the students that are, are going to be automatically engaged anyway. Mm -hmm. We're now in the process of developing an, an assessment tool that is going to help us make those more direct connections between student success outcomes and the development of TRHT. We're still too early in the phases to actually say that because our campuses, we're taking this community-based model and putting it into higher education systems. And we were first and foremost focusing on understanding the narrative about race and racial healing and relationship building. So that is ongoing. And it's something that we know has a direct connection. Our evaluator, has asked us, asked the campuses to engage in that. We are going to be developing tools to get more quantitative evidence. Okay, great. So that's to come. That's to come. Yes, that's to come. Yeah. Okay. We're still in the formative evaluation stage. Mm -hmm. Well, this is, uh, like I said, I, you know, when the the first that I read um, of them and I saw all of the uh, the grants that you all were getting to kind of launch it and uh, and then the work and the summer institutes that you were running to build capacity for the, the member institutions. It just seems like such a viable um, uh, initiative and effort. And the fact that it was a national association behind it and, and scaling it up and out, you know, across multiple institutions. Uh, I'm really excited to see what those outcomes um, you know, are and, and what they yield and in just the experience that already, because even, you know, without those outcomes, there have been outcomes and I, and I know it's been, been good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they mm -hmm. have, and if you look at the, we, the publication, we hold these truths as an article from our evaluator and that gives a formative report of where campuses are, who's participating, what. So we're in that process. Mm -hmm. We have the stages of implementation tool that is being beta tested by our campuses so that we can actually utilize that. Imagine it's a rubric. If you're an AC and you, you know how much we love rubric. So it's a rubric <laughs> that we're utilizing. So we do, we're developing the foundation for the evaluation component, but the direct mm -hmm. connection between the outcomes and student outcomes, we're gonna be collecting that data. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think the, the general moral to the story is um, the um, championing this idea of creating and carving out space, dedicated space, intentional space, multidimensional space um, to, to really deal with race. Um, and that doesn't uh, take away all of the, the separate and individual things that might be happening all over campus. Um, but I think there is a, a, a viable thing that many institutions, whatever kind of institution, whether you're a, a public school or a private school or a community college or um, a four-year public, um, thinking about who is, where, where is the institution creating space to just dedicate to this issue um, and to eradicating it, dealing with it, addressing it. Okay, so exactly. yeah. we end um, the, the sessions with these quick fire questions. Um, so the, this, the idea for the faculty lounge kind of came from um, my love of Inside the Actor Studio, um, which was a, a show that used to come on Bravo. And um, it was out of Pace University and he would sit with, um, with accomplished actors and kind of just have conversation um, mm -hmm. about the, the, the craft. And, um, and so there were these uh, questions that he asked of every guest at the end and, um, and he borrowed those questions. Um, he, being James Lipton, uh, was the host of that show. He borrowed those questions from uh, a French scholar, Bernard Pivot. Pivot. And so um, in um, a nod to them and to end our, our uh, uh, time today, I'm gonna ask you these, these quick fires. What is your favorite okay. word? Faith. Faith. 
What is your least favorite word? Hate. Mm. What excites you professionally? When we actually do something that connects um, with the work, not only of the institution, but of the, within the community that is going to be paying it forward so that we can influence the next generation. That's important to me. Mm -hmm. Making so a like better space. A foundation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I need to make a better space for the next generation. It makes it, yeah. What are your, uh, oh, what turns you off professionally? Oh, when people say one thing and then their actions demonstrate the opposite. <laughs> Um, what are your two favorite books dealing with race and life? Um, so I've, I've always been drawn to the book Rising Out of Hatred because that was the, the story of someone who um, grew up in white supremacy and because of education and because of his relationships was able to change that perceptive. It gives hope to me that anyone no matter what your circumstances cannot, um, can eliminate hate within their heart. Mm -hmm. So that's powerful to me. Um, I know this is kind of goofy, but uh, I just read this book about they, Oprah Winfrey did with gratitude and everything. So I, those were stories that, um, that inspired me because I think that we have a lot to be grateful for in the midst mm -hmm. of all this chaos that we're mm -hmm. in right now. So mm -hmm. yeah. from a we're life here. perspective, that's important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, what's your favorite protest song? Uh, it should be, and it, it, we shall overcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Oh, I would love to be. So many of my relatives are gospel singers. Oh, I didn't can you get sing? That. No, oh, oh, okay. no, 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 you say what I wanted, no, no, I can't. That's what I would love to be, if I could be a, if I could be a gospel singer, yes. Oh, okay, yeah, my family can sing, but I can't in my head, everyone else doesn't. Yeah, me too, me. that's where I yeah, am, yeah. Toby, in my yeah. head, yeah. <laughs> um, what profession would you suck at? You wouldn't want me flying a plane. Okay, this, this is the second person that said this. <laughs> you would not, uh, you would not want me doing that. <laughs> And if heaven exists or whatever afterworld you might believe, what would you, you like to hear God, Allah, Ra, whoever that being might be, say when you arrive? So um, I do personally believe that heaven exists. And so I would want God to tell me, um, well done, but well done as being a mother, a wife, a daughter, a sister, a friend, a niece all the things I want them to say that, that I was there for my family. That means a lot to me. Yes. Yes. Well, thank you so much, Dr. McNair for this wonderful conversation. Um, again, I, you know, we, we, we started it with um, the culture, the family, the rootedness. Uh, we kind of ended it that same yes. way. <laughs> um, and so that really illuminates that all of the in-between um, is about who, who we spiritually, culturally, um, who, the, the rootedness of, of, of who we are. Um, and uh, that we're just spending time on this earth um, trying to, to, um, to become more of our cultural selves and, um, and, and do the, the, the work of family and love. So yeah. thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time. And thank you everyone for, um, for joining us. And our next session will be on November 10th with uh, Dr. Frank Tuitt. And we'll be talking about plantation politics and um, campus rebellions. So see you then. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you.